Welcome to Brewing TV. I'm Chip Walton. I'll only be with you for a quick introduction this week because we're doing something a little different and turning the episode over to two guest hosts as they brew a very unique beer. Michael Agnew is the man behind a perfect pint, Minnesota's only full-service beer tasting event planner. He is also the state's first certified Cicerone. Mark Roberts is a video artist and Michael's brewing partner. Mark frequently visits Finland, which will come in handy today because the guys are brewing sati. Sati is a traditional Finnish beer brewed in a way that we think many homebrewers will find intriguing. So grab a pint and sit back. Join Michael and Mark for this beautiful autumn day brew session and then follow up with their winter blast tasting notes. All for brew and brew for all. Hi, I'm Michael Agnew from Perfect Pint, and I'm Mark. I'm a friend of Michael's. Been homebrewing for about a year now. Michael got me into it. I've been homebrewing for about eight years now, and we are brewing sati. Sati is a traditional Finnish beer. Uh, and I'm going to let Mark tell you the inspiration for us to have brewed sati the first time. This is our third go at it. <laughs> well, uh, I, I was living in Finland for about uh, eight years until I came to the States in 2009. And um, last year, I saw in one of the Northern Brewer catalogues that they'd made sati. And I thought, oh, that'd be an interesting little challenge for us to try and make in an authentic as possible manner. So he threw down the gauntlet and I picked it up. Sati is, uh, like I said, a primitive Finnish uh, beer. It is traditionally unboiled, unhopped. Um, it is consumed usually within the first two weeks of having been made right out of the fermenter. Uh, and it's usually brewed with baking yeast, so like bread yeast. Uh, and we are trying as much as possible uh, given the equipment we have and the necessity to bottle, uh, to stay as traditional as we possibly can. What is the most difficult part? Sourcing juniper. <laughs> Stealing juniper. Stealing juniper. <laughs> uh, that's re that is probably the most difficult part. Yeah. There's nothing difficult about it. It's pretty much normal brewing except uh, the extra step, which we'll do in a bit of adding the juniper into the mash tun and then pasteurizing instead of boiling. In the past, we've sourced, sourced, <laughs> obtained, <laughs> if you will, our juniper from neighbor, <laughs> neighbors around the, the neighborhood. So we're just walking around with clippers looking for juniper bushes and surreptitiously clipping some off, uh, moving from bush to bush so we don't take too much from any one person. Uh, this time, I've, we found a juniper bush down by the river uh, I live just a couple blocks from the river, so we found a juniper bush down there that's not in anybody's yard okay. uh, and clipped off of there. It's a, uh, well, it's a kind of piney, a slightly spicy, fruity piney uh, aroma. Um, and obviously the berries are the same things which you use to flavor gin, so you, you're kind of familiar with the flavor from that. Um, but the flavor comes out in the beer as, as very twiggy. Um, there's, a, there's a subtle juniper undertaste to it, but in the main, it's a very, it really tastes like this kind of part of the bush, not so much the uh, leaves. It's got a very kind of woody taste. have a five gallon mash ton and we have 14 pounds of grain which pretty much maxes it out. has a reputation as a beer which is brewed by Finnish alcoholics in the backwoods um, but it's kind of gaining a uh, 
a, a better reputation these days. I was at a beer festival in, in Finland and there was a lot of Asati brewers uh, were presenting their different versions of it and some of them were very good. I mean a lot of them taste quite similar but, um, but they were all you know really really good beers and, and very different to the Satis which, which get made here um, which don't kind of, I mean it's very difficult I think to make the beer in the traditional way and, and sell it in bottles because of the restrictions on, on what makes a beer. Um, so it was really great to be able to actually taste the real thing. is pretty thick and full to the brim. It's, uh, let's have a look. There we go. Nice and gloopy. So what we're doing now, we're, uh, we want to put the uh, juniper, we want to line the thing with juniper, so we have to dump the mash out of here into another container. Now a lot of home brewers are going to freak out about this because they worry about hot side aeration. When you uh, heavily aerate the hot uh, work, I have never found that to be a problem. I get stuck mashes on occasion and have to end up dumping my uh, mash back and forth. And I've never noticed any effect of hot side aeration. So I'm not at all concerned about doing this. <laughs> You're putting the false bottom back in, yeah. Yeah. And then we're just going to take some juniper. Wow, that smells good. Mm. Oh, there's some berries there as well. Excellent. Yeah. Let's have them in there. And we're just going to line the bottom of the mash tun to make a like an extra filter. A great thing about this too is the, the juniper in there tends to stop the stuck mash because <laughs> it's an extra yeah. filter. Or for one in, maybe. All right, so we've got the juniper in. That's our, our attempt to uh, imitate the, the Kuruna trough that would be traditionally used. So we're gonna filter the mash through that, uh, that juniper bed. So what I'm doing now is heating our sparge water. This I won't bring to a boil. This I'll heat up to about 190 degrees. Uh, and that's what we'll slowly feed in uh, to rinse the sugar out of the grain once the mash is done. So we're just gonna recirculate the wort through a few times until it quits running murky like that. Try and get it as clear as possible. This is how I sparge too, unusually, perhaps. Rather than getting a fancy whirly gig thing, which I had at the beginning and found that uh, it didn't work so well for me. Uh, I just heat up my sparge water in that separate pot, float a Tupperware lid in the top, and uh, just every once in a while scoop some water on top of that. While recirculating, Michael took a gravity reading of the first runnings. It came up a bit short, so he and Mark decided to let the mash rest another 30 minutes in hopes of converting more of that sugar. It may have added some time to the brew day, but it helped raise the gravity and... Well, my initial reaction is it's much clearer than it was before. I was saying before that it was so cloudy coming out of there, and that kind of suggested to me that we had a lot of unconverted starch. Uh, it's much clearer now that tells me maybe we've converted some of that starch to sugars and we might be in a better position than we were before. 
whatever it is, it's going to be what it is. But you can already you can see from that that yeah, it's, it's not so milky anymore. Yeah. There's nothing mm. like the smell yeah. of this work. Yeah. And I think we were just talking about smelling the juniper. It smells like that, and it's it's the the juniper that gives it the mm. odd smell, and then the maltiness. But it's really this delightful. Is, this is much more like the color I remember the first one. Yeah, coming coming out as. Uh, well, it raised it a little. Uh, We're just over 23 now. Uh, so Maybe it'll increase. Yeah. <laughs> we'll see. piece of machinery for this sophisticated piece of machinery <laughs> is to measure the volume that I've run off so I have it marked off by gallons half gallons and quarter gallons now I'm getting a sweet piney resinous aroma from it and a syrupy juniper pine it is a syrupy juniper pine nutty syrupy mm -hmm. juniper yeah, pine nutty yeah The problem with these things is that my eyesight is bad <laughs> and the letter, the numbers are so freaking small. We have actually gone up though, we're at 24 now. Ah, uh, I see, yeah, my theory. My theory, there's a big bunch of gloopy sugars in there being blocked by the juniper. <laughs> so we'll keep doing this and see what we hit. When we made uh, sati the first time and the second time, we'd never actually tasted the drink, um, but uh, when I went back to Finland, I did some research and found some places which were which were selling it. Um, so I managed to bring a bottle back here, and I also found a pub in Helsinki, which uh, serves sati out of a bucket from the back behind the pub. Uh, so I went in and and ordered some. I was asking the woman at the bar where where she gets it from, who makes the beer, and you know she didn't really know. She just said that some guy brings it in in buckets every couple of weeks. We had like, she had no idea who brings it in, or the legality of it or anything, uh, but they serve it in the bar. And it's pretty nice. It's big, thick, malty, sweet, juniper, twiggy uh, beer, flat. And uh, it's often, you know, drank in uh, weddings and, dr and brewed specifically for that purpose. The one that he brought home, the commercial version, was so rich and malty with uh, more of a background twiggy with lots of fruit in it. So I could see it was kind of rich and caramely and toasty. I could see it going with uh, any kind of roasted poultry, roasted pork. Um, it could even be like a dessert after dinner kind of thing because it was 10, 11 percent mm. and almost barley wine like. Uh, put it in a snifter after you're done, it'd be great. We ran off to almost three gallons, about two and three quarter gallons. The recipe was formulated for four gallons, but there we are. Uh, so two and three quarter gallons, we're at 1088-ish. So I wanted to be, I figured we'd end maybe around 1090, so we're in the ballpark. Uh, we want to be 10, 11, or nine or 10 percent alcohol for the this beer in the end. So we are ready to put this on the stove to bring it up to 170 degrees to pasteurize. One of the things that we like to do is just to add a little more juniper in there, let it steep while it's pasteurizing, just because. <laughs> Okay, we'll call it 170. Alright, shut that down. We put the lid on it. And then uh, we just set the timer for 20 minutes. And that should stay fairly close to 170 for that 
amount of time. Uh, really anything above like 165 is good enough. Um, we'll just leave that there and then once it's done we'll chill it down into the fermenter. Meanwhile, in the mash tun, we still have all this grain in here, and I checked the runnings that are coming out, and those are still at 1065-ish, something like that. So there's still a lot of sugar left in this mash tun, and we're going to be able to get a second beer out of this. It would be a shame to waste it. It would be a shame to waste all that sugar, exactly. <laughs> so what we're going to do, I have a bunch of miscellaneous grains in the basement. Um, so I've got here... And this might not even be accurate because I know at least one of these is a mixture of various things that I used for display and got put in one bag. So this says it's a quarter pound of Victory. This says it's a quarter pound of Caramel 55. A uh, quarter pound of Pilsner. And that's supposedly a half a pound of Special B. I don't know that any of these are what they say they are. <laughs> but we're just going to... Uh, take some of these and kind of mash them up with a rolling pin, put them in there. I've got some more water heating in the kitchen. Um, we're just going to re-mash this. So we'll mash again for another half hour or so, run it off into another kettle, and this one will actually boil up, add hops, uh, all the normal stuff that you would do for a beer and it will become whatever, it will become beer is what it will become. <laughs> <laughs> so I've got uh, two gallons of water at about 153, four degrees. We'll just add it in there as much as we can get in there. Now the juniper twigs are still in there, so. Oh, they are, aren't they? So I mustn't <laughs> mess that up too much, probably. So it's, because uh, I could do. The second mash is gonna be mashed with some juniper in it. So yeah, the wait, second beer should wait. be quite interesting. Oops, sorry, I'm looking That's probably about all we're gonna get. Yeah, I don't think I can really do nothing apart from spill it now, so. Once that beeps, we'll set it to 50, uh, 25. Go and rinse. What am I saying? We're gonna let that go for 30 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> there are too many times going on at once right now. Uh, that's traditional. I, I don't know why they wouldn't have boiled it, but typically it's run off straight from the mash tun into the fermenter uh, without being boiled. Again, the only reason we're doing this is because we want to bottle it and not explode bottles. Um, otherwise, we would probably run it straight off into the fermenter as well. Maybe it has something to do. I mean, if they were making it for parties and festivals and they knew they'd be drinking it quickly, then yep. they didn't need to worry about, you know, making it safe. So the first couple of times we made a sati, we used a uh, Red Star baker's yeast because uh, traditionally you're supposed to use a fresh baker's yeast. But this time uh, I was back in Finland in the summertime, so I managed to get hold of some authentic Finnish baker's yeast and uh, bring it back through customs on the plane and uh, smuggle it into the country. Um, so we're going to try that this time. It's, it's behaving a little strangely, but um, we're going to hope for the best. There she comes. Now I sometimes like to slow this down just by crimping that a little bit because the slower it runs there, the more it's in contact with the water flowing through and the cooler it'll get. So that's coming out of there pretty, pretty darn cold. Mm -hmm. No sense in wasting it. That, in essence, is how we brew sati. Uh, I don't know, we, like I said, we're trying to stay as traditional as possible. Hopefully uh, it turns out this time. The I've, first got one I've got a good feeling. I've got a good feeling I have a good feeling, one. too. It has a good color, good aroma. Uh, it's stronger than the last two, mm -hmm. so we'll see. Mm. Uh, it took a little longer than we expected because we had to add that half an hour of mash, uh, which I think did a lot of good for us. Otherwise, otherwise a, a decent brew day. Beautiful mm. weather, nice day for brewing. So, uh, all for brew. And brew for all. Well, winter came. Huh. <laughs> Ha <laughs>
So the sati that we made a few days ago, or a few days ago, a few weeks ago, when it was a beautiful sunny day, lots of fall color out here, uh, times change. Yep. But it's ready, and we couldn't let you uh, not know how it turned out. So we've got a couple of bottles here. Um, I've got my uh, appropriate Finnish reindeer horn opener <laughs> to do the honors. Hopefully it's not frozen. <laughs> Pours a kind of a, a murky light amber, mm -hmm. no head because it's uncarbonated mm -hmm. intentionally, as is traditional for sati. Oh, that's so lovely. Musty, twig sprucy, twiggy. Yeah, twigginess is there again. A little bit of sour in the background. Mm -hmm. The maltiness is kind of yeah thinner in the malt uh, than I would want. It's still pretty good though. I mean, it's really it's really getting closer to what we're aiming for. It's closer than previous attempts. Uh, the aroma, the flavor kind of follows the aroma. There's more malt in the flavor than in the uh, smell. Mm. Kind of caramel, a little bit toasty. Mm. The juniper really comes through. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's not just twiggy though. Past examples we've made have been really like sticks. Um, yeah. This is much more kind of nutty, sprucey almost. Mm. It's got that kind of citrusy thing still mm -hmm. going on though, a kind of sour citrusy thing a little bit in the background. Not as bad as the previous one we made, but um, yeah. but it's undeniably still. I Still think that there. seems to be a characteristic of fermenting with the bread yeast, mm. is that uh, mm. this kind of lemony, citrusy. It's not sour like infected sour, it's more like lemons. Yeah, yeah. It's really, it's it's really got hints of the proper sati, of mm -hmm. the real sati. It's like uh, the color is a little bit light, the body's a little bit thin, but I mean, just, you know, you can tell it's getting there. It really tastes like with three quarters of the way there. When we brewed, we got a second beer out of this because our runnings ended up really high. Uh, so we had room for more beer. We added a bunch of random grains from the basement. Um, this one, unlike the sati, we did hop this up. Uh, we used uh, sterling for bittering hops, about an ounce, something like that. It was whatever I had in the freezer. <laughs> um, we used an ounce of zatz at the very end of the boil for aroma. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, I dry hopped dry it with hopped Centennial. It, yeah. We fermented it with a random packet of dried yeast that I had in the fridge that I don't even know what it came from or how long it had been there. <laughs> uh, so this was a, a chancy, risky, experimental beer to say the least. Um, we did carbonate this one. Although this bottle doesn't, oh, there it is. No, it didn't carbonate that much anyway, it, did it? It was a low, low carbonation. Oh. Mm. We called it hoppy sati. We called it hoppy sati, yes. <laughs> and it's a lovely aroma. I mean, it's got huge hop mm. aroma, the big, like, melony, citrus, <laughs> orange. Mm. Yeah, but kind of sweet as well. It's like a, it's not like grassy. It's a yeah. beautifully sweet hoppy <laughs> aroma. And then mm. underneath that, that hop aroma is the, the ginny, sprucey juniper is still there as well. I think the hops, the, the sterling hops, the spice of that um, actually really pumps up that juniper mm. taste. All right, so all in all, I think the second, or this is the third sati brewing experiment uh, was successful. We're closer to what we're aiming for. Next time we're going to tweak it a little, up the Munich malt content, um, aim for a higher starting gravity, uh, and see what we can do to get rid of the citrus lemony stuff, I'm not sure. Hopefully we'll get a second beer out of it again, see what happens with that. Mm -hmm. um, so, all for brew. Brew for all. And this time we're really saying goodbye. Mm -hmm.